again, my name is Leslie Volley. I'm the director for Pierce's Center for Career and Professional Development, and we are just getting started with Women in Leadership 2024. And the theme of today is sorry, not sorry, taking risks and being bold and ambitious in the face of obstacles and hurdles, something that I think that we've all um, experienced. And we're really excited to hear the wisdom, the stories from our, our great panel. It's also something that in my team, our career counselors, we hear a lot from our students is when to take risks, when they says knowing that taking risks is often how we make progress towards our careers. Um, and so I think that this will be really, really impactful. Um, thank you preliminarily to some of the great people that kind of came out tonight, our panel, our moderator, Amanda. Major props to everybody who's in this room. Um, I see Dr. Rita Tolliver Roberts, one of our great women in leadership. I think Dr. Caro might be on the call. Dr. Caro is Pierce's first woman president and CEO. Um, so we've got some great women in leadership in the house tonight already. Um, and on that note, I'd like to introduce Andrew Zidel. He's going to talk about what he does a little bit of Pierce and introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Andrew. I'm the Associate Director of Employer Relations. So my role is really to, uh, to reach out into the business community to create talent pipelines and relationships between employers, organizations, and the school. Um, in planning for this event, I've, I've really had the privilege of getting to know the panelists uh, individually. Their journeys are impressive and inspiring. You're gonna hear about major risks and pivots taken in their lives, their careers, their business relationships, and even in their personal relationships. Um, each of the panelists uh, fought through moments of self-doubt and decided to double down on themselves and it's paid off. Um, Trina Jones, uh, who's an alumna, is the executive director of the of Global Academics. I'm also gonna give just a quick little fun fact about each of the panelists. Um, Trina certainly knows the value of trusting the right people in, in life. And one of the quotes that Trina loves is, if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. Jacqueline Jarvis is also an alumna of Pierce. She's the VP at Alta Language Services. And fun fact, her incredible journey actually began across the ocean. Um, while when she arrived here, she worked her way up and put herself in a position where she was able to have, have options. Her quote that she lives by is, don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. Wanda Amaro, another alumna of Pierce College. Um, Wanda is the VP of HR at St. Chris Hospital for Children. Um, she's new to her role. And Wanda has a tendency of joining in organizations and situations that are in transition. <laughs> so um, that's sort of the real uh, polite way of, of, uh, of saying when, when organizations are in a little bit of a chaos, Wanda comes in and helps sort things out. So um, she, uh, she loves a Sheryl Sandberg quote, which is, Leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. Great quote there. Um, our final panelist is Vicki Sack. Vicki is uh, one of the co-founders of Juno Search Partners, co-founder and partner of Juno Capital. Um, Vicki is very much involved with the community, serving on uh, board positions and committee positions within uh, the Society of People and Strategy. Um, she's involved with multiple SHRM chapters, multiple chambers of commerce. Um, she also volunteers at the Women's Resource Center. And um, fun fact is that her children give her the inspiration because they're both active uh, college student athletes, balancing those these strict demands of what a student athlete is these days. So they inspire Vicky, so we're very glad you could make it. Our moderator, our moderator tonight is Amanda Hill. Amanda is our AVP of External Affairs and Marketing here at Pierce. She was actually uh, listed as one of the 40 under 40 recipients for last year. We're very proud of the work Amanda's doing. Um, also very involved with the community. So no further, take it away, Amanda. Thanks. You give a, a round of applause for our Hey, Andrew. Welcome, everybody. Um, I, 
did you mention? I'm also an alumna of Pierce. I got my master's degree up here. So, so happy to be in the company of so many alums. Um, thinking maybe we'll get you. Get that <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so as Andrew said, um, I, I have enjoyed 12 wonderful years here at Pierce College. Um, I think I was actually at the first Women in Leadership. My brain goes back that far. Um, and it's always, like Leslie said, it's been a it's been a night that I love too. It always fills me with motivation and inspiration. Um, the the key mentors in my life have been women, and I am so grateful to everyone that they've taught me, um, and that they continue to teach me. And I think that events like this are really good to help us find each other and find community, um, and really you know talk about things that are important. Um, and so. I'm also a little nervous. I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. I've never moderated a panel before, so if my face starts to get red, now you know what's going on. But so please give me some grace, and uh, we'll get through this. Um, so, but I want to take it to our panelists, right? That's what you guys are here for. Um, so to get started, um, I'm hoping that you can all just give us a brief overview of your career journey, and maybe one word that describes your leadership style. Uh, Trina, should we start with you? So my career journey, oh my gosh. Um, so I had I had a bunch of jobs. Um, from, you know, like 18 up until about 23, 24. Didn't know what I wanted to do with my life at that time. Um, I became a mother young, um, but I always liked law. So I said, I'm going to become a paralegal. I'm not going to go to law school, but I'm going to become a paralegal. And so, um, I went to the community college where I was living. I grew up in New Jersey and I went there, um, messed around and didn't finish. So moved over here to Pennsylvania and still had the desire to want to return back to school. So I, I um, enrolled at Pierce College and, and I was paralegal all the way. That's the way I was going. And um, I took probably about two or three classes and I said, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so at that time I had, you know, different jobs. Um, and then I moved into the business administration program and went completely online. At that time, I was uh, probably married by then. Yeah, I was married by then, had children. So it was like, I need to be home because when I get off of work, I don't want to have to go to anybody's campus. And so I did that. Um, and so during that time, I worked in different uh, legal departments. I worked for um, a couple of attorneys. Um, but even still with, with that business degree, um, my goal was still to be a paralegal, but I didn't want to just have a paralegal degree and be stuck. And so that's why I moved into the business. So I was working for an attorney um, for a few months, uh, part-time, and I um, knew someone who was working at a school and she said, oh, and this attorney had gone on vacation for the summer. So she said, person I knew, she called me and she said, well, do you need a job? Yeah, sure, I need a job. So I ended up working at a school and I was doing a pro some project work um, for the school. And I figured that was good because by the time September rolled around, I'm going to go back to this law, law firm and, you know, do my thing because I'm going to become a paralegal, right? <laughs> so I did that. And then when it was when it was time to go back to the, the law office, the CEO of the school said, oh, I had to find a job for you. So she created a position. Um, and I actually ended up staying and became the business development and compliance officer. So still having some legal stuff behind me, I was like, okay, I can do this. Um, and I worked in that position for a couple of years. And then maybe about two or three years later, I was promoted to the director of operations um, of the school. And so I worked in that position for a good 10 years um, and left after that, started my own insurance business, did that for a few years. Stopped doing that, went back into the education field, and now here I am as executive director uh, for Global Academies, which is a business and, and business and um, instructional services organization. So we support schools in their business operations as well as their educational um, program. And so that's pretty much my journey. Shortened. Because it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually have, I think I have like three different leadership styles depending on the situation. So I could be democratic mostly, um, strategic, and then coaching. So I think those are my three. Yeah, that coaching piece is really key, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Juan, how about you? Oh, we got what, 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my journey started, um, you know, 
as when I was little, I didn't speak a word of English. Let's just say that. So when my mom put me in Catholic school, I only spoke Spanish. So these nuns really banged the hell out of myself, you know, trying to get this English out of me. But I learned. Um, the journey of my career, though, started um, after high school. Met my, I still married to my high school sweetheart, had a child early. Um, and went back to take a couple classes in, you know, uh, community college and so forth. But landed a job with IRS, so I was a bilingual tax examiner. I had one child, wasn't working for me, it was too far, I needed better benefits, whatever. So they told me about a job working at Episcopal Hospital in the heart of North Philly. And I said, you know what, I'm going to take this opportunity. It was right there in HR. It was an HR clerk. And when I started to work there, I loved HR. I loved, you know, back then it was called personnel. Now I'm really, you know, trying to tell you what my age is here. And um, when I started to realize what does personnel or human resources is all about, I loved it. I love the fact that there's employee relations and management and um, all those opportunities that you can learn that you can actually take this role anywhere you go. You can do HR pretty much any, in any organization. Was promoted like five times in two years because I was like a spud. Now, mind you, I'm still raising a child and I have a family. Um, I took risk. You know, I landed jobs. I worked in most of my career 30 years in hospitals. I was promoted at every level. And I think I've worked in every hospital in Philadelphia. Temple, um, Tenant, Frankfurt, Taurus, Love, Jefferson, you name it, I was all there. But I was like a sponge. So I wanted to learn everything. And I was given the opportunity to be a director um, when I was at Temple being a bilingual recruiter because they were opening up a uh, bilingual unit. And they were hiring all these Latino nurses. So I was able to hire 35 nurses in a month, right, to, to, to make this unit happen. But I was called back because I worked at Parkview Hospital, it's no longer there, um, to be a director of HR. And that scared me a little bit because I didn't have my degree, but I had the knowledge to back myself up with what I was doing. So did the, the director role for a period of time. And at some point in my life, I said, you know what, I need to go back to school. I need to finish what I need to finish. And I started to call around the schools. I like to always do my, my homework, my due diligence on what's the best, what's the best for me, because I have to balance my family and the school and my job, because we still needed to work, because my, I needed to feed my family. My husband was working too, and la di la di to make long story short. Bottom line is that I worked my way up to even to a position of chief people officer, which is one of my other jobs that I've had. Um, at the Asociación Puerto Ricanos en Macha, which is the APM. It's a, a association of Puerto Ricans on the move, but it's an organization that works with human services, um, uh, but they take care of all people in North Philly. A lot of DHS. So I got to learn and stay with working in hospitals, working in places where I still meddled with pediatrics, uh, which was, that's true to my heart. And I think because I committed so much, to that, it landed me now to work with um, St. Christopher's, which is part of Tower Health. So, and I just really condensed everything, but going back to school, good, getting my degree at uh, Pierce, after that, even opened more doors. I already had doors opening because I, I'm a fighter. I don't say, I don't take no easily. So, um, when that happened and I got my degree, I did everything online. We were just talking about that earlier. Then only came in to pick up my cap and gown. That's kind of funny. Um, and then they featured my story. Amanda did an interview for uh, featured my story the day of my graduation. It's not good looking at your face really big on the screen, <laughs> uh, especially if you have extra cheeks. But um, uh, and and in a nutshell, um, I work hard, and now this is that's my career, you know. And I was able to balance everything: uh, family, school, um, my uh, my job. Um, and, and I'll talk about with more stuff and the other questions. Oh, one word. Um, and I know that there is there is um, a, a slew of leadership words that I can use, but I think one word that always helped me connect with everyone that I work with is I'm a coach as a leader. And I think that's one of the most important things. We always acquire those soft skills and good skills about 
you know, communication, effective communication and all that, that's great. But it's not gonna work if you're not approachable. So that's my biggest check for a group. I like to start my journey by saying that my parents um, are immigrants. Um, my father is from St. Kitts and my mother uh, is from Montserrat. From, and that's in the West Indies. From there, they went to England, Manchester, England, where they had two boys and two girls. Um, they always thought we have to come to America because that's the land of dreams and that's where the land where everything happens. So um, my father packed us up and we came to America. We actually landed in the Bronx. Very different, very different here in America. <laughs> the kids are very different. Um, How old were you? I was very young. I was about 12. I was about 12 years old. Um, I had a strong accent. And uh, some of the kids didn't like that. Um, but as I grew older and knew that, um, yeah, this is the place where I want to be. This is the place where I think we can thrive. Um, I started kind of looking at the different industries and what it is I wanted to do. I knew that college was the next step, but it wasn't a good fit for me at the time because I wanted to jump into that market. So I started out in advertising, which I loved. Then I moved to banking, which I loved. Then I went into pharma the pharmaceutical business, which I loved. <laughs> I did some IT work, programming. I learned uh, quite a few uh, programming languages, which I really loved. And then I ended up in the assessment business. That's where I am now. With my former company, I spent probably about 18, 18 and a half years, let's say 18 and a half years. And I think that that's where I kind of developed, you know, um, specialty in, uh, in assessment, um, project management, process management, um, and that's essentially where I settled. Um, where I am now, I'm with Alta Language Services. Uh, that's a culmination of all those things that I had from my past that allows me to function now. Um, you heard of Jack of all trades? I'm Jacqueline of all trades. <laughs> So um, to top it off, I think that my management style, which has helped with my success, um, is more collaborative than anything else. I like the differences. I like to hear opinions. I like to um, see others contribute uh, to whatever it is we're doing, to the success of the, the organization. And that's helped me in my personal life as well as my professional life. I'm starting to sense a trend here about, you know, some of, some of the words that are being used. Uh, my name is Vicky Sack. Um, I, uh, I started my career in uh, federal government and working on Capitol Hill. So I was a political science major and a music minor. My dad joked around when I was graduating from college that I was going to be a singing senator. But yeah. that did not happen. <laughs> Um, but I did work on the Hill for quite a few years. I lived down in D.C. Um, and I thought I was going to be a forever D.C. person. Um, and my husband got a job offer in Philadelphia. We were not married at the time. We didn't have a mortgage. We didn't have children. And he said, what do you think about moving to Philadelphia? And I said, Shh, what the heck? I don't have, like, I have nothing tying me here. Like, this is, I'm never going to just pick up and go somewhere. Now it's time to do it. So I came here very naively thinking, who wouldn't hire me? I'm just going to walk in somewhere and somebody will give me a job because I've done all these things. And I had a horrible time getting people to understand how to translate what I did for in politics and in the government to corporate functions. And it was very challenging. And I was very, very tenacious. And I actually walked into a recruiting firm. I called a woman at a recruiting firm 
And she was like, well, your recipe is fine. I don't quite know what to do with you. I said, will you just meet me? I'm just pleased. And ironically, it was in this building. It was my first job. Oh, gosh. It's all rough. <laughs> um, and so it was a company called Cobart West. I walked in, and within 15 minutes, she offered me a job working for them. She said, you would be great in the recruiting and staffing industry. Do you want to come work for us? And so I did. So I worked in this building for about seven years. Um, and that's how I got started in the business. Um, uh, I've worked for three different firms over the course of my early time in this business. I've been doing this for over 25 years. Um, so I think as far as recruiting firms go, I, I mean, if you know our industry at all, a lot of people jump from firm to firm. I didn't. I stayed in a lot of places. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what I liked about the industry and what I didn't like about the business. The one thing I will say is I went to work for a branch uh, I led a branch of an of a temporary staffing firm for a little while, and I hated it. But if I didn't hate it, it wouldn't push me to start my own company. While I was there, I met my now business partner. We shared similar philosophies on the business, and I had very young kids at the time. She did not. She was so she, I think, was a little. She still is much less risk averse than I am, but. Um, we had talked for six or seven months about starting our own company and what we would do and how it would work. And um, finally, one day, she was just sick of talking about it. And she sent me a text and said, um, and I'm doing this with or without you. Are you in or are you out? And so I looked at my husband and I, I said, oh, and he was like, what do you want to do? And I said, if I sit and watch her do this without me, I am going to regret it every day of my life. And he said, then do it. And so we spent an entire summer putting our company together at five o'clock in the morning and at night. We were very, um, very clear that we wanted, didn't want to um, do anything that would jeopardize our current jobs or, or put our current company in, in, a, in an awkward position. And the day after Labor Day of uh, 2010, we both resigned. And I remember the, the, like two days later sitting in my home office like, what the heck did we just do? Like, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, um, it was a huge, a, a big risk, but a risk worth taking. And I don't, the best decision I ever made. Um, we built the company over the years. Um, we actually got acquired last year by a year and a half ago by a larger company, but we're still running our company very autonomously. Um, and then in 2010, or I mean 2020, during the pandemic, we, um, we decided to open a, an angel investment company. We do a lot of work in Philadelphia with startup companies, and we decided we should put our money where our mouth is and really start to reinvest back into the community that really helped us build a successful company. And so we do a lot of investing in a lot of minority-owned and women-owned companies here in the Philadelphia area. Um, we have some that are outliers, but a lot of that, we have 14 portfolio companies now. Um, which has been really fun. And that was not part of the acquisition. We still own that. That that company will go into perpetuity, you know, regardless of what happens with Judo Search Partners down the road, we will continue to do that. So it's been a lot of fun. So um, my leadership style, I would say, is probably pretty transparent. Um, I'm very honest with my team, but I think people sometimes mistake that in, in, in by thinking that you have to tell your team everything and that they have to know everything. And that's not, I don't think what that means. I think it means letting them know what they need to know to make them make good decisions themselves, to make them feel secure that you're making good decisions for the company. Um, and then I would also say, this is not one word, but our, on our former website, we used to have this term that my business partner was the chief people officer and I was the chief voice of reason. Where I mean, the chief friend maker. She was the chief friend maker, and I was the chief voice of reason. But she was the one who was always going around being everybody's cheerleader. But I was the one where once one wanted to like, what should I do? That was that's what they would come to me. So I think we counter each other. I I don't know if anybody else picked up on it, but the, the words that were used here I think are, are really important. It's not the um, so in the grad program, Mary Pierce, little plug. Uh, we talk a lot about you know it's it's about leadership. It's not about management necessarily, right? It's not about that top-down kind of thing. And what I'm hearing from all of you is the collaboration, coaching, the working together, the like, you know, the, the transparent like teamwork too, um, which I think is is really powerful. And it's it's a new way of doing business. And it's exciting to sit here and listen to us. Um, you know, so my next question was going to be about taking risks. And um, <laughs> 
So does anybody else have uh, have a story about taking risk and and how how that worked out for you? How's that sparking? Staring at you, Wanda. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're staring at me. So yeah, I think every with every opportunity or every position, um, there's a risk involved, right? You know, we tend to, and I know that's one of your questions, but we tend to mostly females criticize ourselves more and, and, and ask ourselves, can I do this job? Can I really do this job? Am I going to be set up to fail or am I going to, will, will I make it? Can I juggle my family life? Can I juggle my, you know, work life and all this stuff? So we second guess, you know, like, so for me, every time um, I took it too is, you know, with the challenges, I've been working in HR for a very long time. And being a Latina female, there's been a lot of challenges on my part of trying to say I have to be here. Um, I report to uh, Pamela Hernandez, who is the senior VP of Tower Health, and we were talking, she's also Latina. And we were talking about these challenges. You know, I would just say, hey, you know, what do you think about this question? Because I could see where we take risks all the time. And, and she couldn't say it better. She said something to me that says, she said, don't wait to be invited to the head of the table. She says, that chair to be seated is much yours as anybody else's in this room. You've done the work, you're already here, just take your seat. And when she said that to me, and I said, you know what, that's exactly what I had to do every time that I went into a new position or I went to go work in a new organization um, is to say, here I am, Here's what, here's what I can do for your organization. Um, and I felt that every time I jumped to a, a different position, I, I am, you are taking that risk. Because at the end of the day, you being in HR, we're all replaceable in our jobs, right? It, it, it's just the norm, right? However, you know, we want to make sure that when we go into our jobs that we're given 110% all the time. But there could be differences um, of how people believe in us, right? Can they, you know, can I trust them to do the work? And our performance and our success relies on us anyway. So um, that risk that I took my first job as a director of HR back at Parkview Hospital, and then seven years later, I had to close and nail 435 employees was a huge risk because I went in without a degree but what I did go in is with knowledge, and I learned a lot from people that I worked with. So, um, and I think that that was my huge risk first. Risk, but I think that's my answer to that question. And everything you do is risk. Yeah, it is. It is. Trina, what about you? Any notable risks? I touched on it briefly when I did my introduction. That was leaving a job after ten years to go sell insurance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I did. I did it for about two two years or so. Um, I did pretty well, but things happened, and I was like, yeah, now I have to go get a job. Um, but yeah, that, it was definitely a big risk because there was no steady paycheck coming in. There was no benefits, so um, you know, my husband had to like really pick it up. So you know, we survived, but scary jump, right? Yeah, you don't know. Yeah. But I, I do have to add, I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, that every risk I took, I was supported by my family. So, you know, um, my husband, my mom, and my sister, and, and, you know, of course you would bounce all your ideas with them, right? But I think that if I didn't have that, I probably would have taken as much risk as I have because I, I do have the family support. And then that's safe enough. That's gotta be there. Um, well, and that kind of leads, I mean, we had talked earlier about you know, the work life balance that <laughs> yeah. we all struggle to find, right? But they we're all working at it. I know you had you had, you know, some thoughts from some you know, your career. Yeah. Can you touch on those? Um, just a little bit. So as far as risk is, I think um the last year and a half is probably one of the biggest risks. Um, I've ever taken. I was with a, a company uh, for 18 years, and um, a recruiter called me up and offered me a position as a vice president, current uh, position. Um, I didn't think I was quite ready. Um, first of all, it was like, was this phone call real? Like, <laughs> is this real? Um, because I was uh, a director, 
right? Um, and this is a big job. So um, they said they think I'm perfect for the job and, you know, let's just set up an interview and everything. So I wanted to be prepped for the, 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 the meeting. Um, I was also going through some personal challenges as well. Um, I was uh, separating from my husband. I was uh, going to a grief period, the loss of my son. Um, and uh, just all these things were happening and then this came up, right? Um, I wanted changes at my uh, current job and then this came up. And um, as I was lying on the sofa and taking this uh, phone call, I said, why not? You know, throughout my career, I started over again at different, you know, uh, industries. And why wouldn't I be successful here? Why would not? So um, I worked with a recruiter and prepped properly uh, for the job. Long story short, they hired me. Um, and it was something at my age, because I'm, you know, getting towards the end, you know, of uh, working, you know, thinking about retirement and everything. It was a huge risk for me. It really was. But um, I think that, you know, the fact that I had the credentials, thank you to Pierce, you know, um, and then I obtained my master's degree. So that was taken care of. You know, I had the support of my family, right? Um, they were saying, you know, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? They say no. And then, you know, my friends and my colleagues, you know, they were like, you know, if you can, do it. Um, I did, and it worked out. It worked out well. That's great. Um, that's kind of making me think about this this another question that we had, which was, you know, there is a study on there, HP, that you know, often when women apply for a promotion, if they only need about sixty percent of the criteria, they're not going to apply, right? But men will go ahead and do that. Um, and that, you know, that kind of hesitation about our skills, about our abilities, I think is is really challenging for advancement for women in the workplace, right? Um, so Vicki, I'm wondering, because you you do talent placement, you do all these things, you have that experience about translating something into something else. Can you speak to that at all? Well, when I talk to my clients, I mean, you have this laundry list of a job description. And that, it's really a wish list at, at the end of the day. I mean, the chances of one person kind of checking every box on that list. So I always say, when I'm working with my clients, what are the absolutes? Like, what what are the non-negotiables here? And then what are the nice-to-haves? And then when I'm talking to, to candidates about the nice-to-haves, where are those transferable things that might fit in? And you're right about when, I mean, I, I still cannot, sometimes I, we still get resumes, you know, and nothing against somebody, you know, being a cashier at McDonald's, but applying for a VP of HR position. And then it just blows <laughs> my mind, and it's usually a man. Um, I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that is true. Like, it's not. It's not wrong. But um, I do. Yourself, right? I do think. I think about that. You know, just in general, like with with my daughter, and you know, just just knowing that you can do something. I didn't think I could run a company, but I thought if I don't show my daughter that I'm gonna, I was miserable in my job, and I thought I'm gonna, I'm setting a really good. I know that this is gonna be really hard, and I'm probably gonna have to spend a lot of time missing some things right now while she's young, but I feel like the lessons that I'm teaching her and the example that I'm setting is way more important than all of that stuff. And, um, you know, they they watched me, you know, build a company, my kids. And so I, I don't know, I think that was a better lesson than but the best lesson I could have given them, quite honestly. And and it's gonna probably pay off down, you know, so long. You're gonna see your, something happen to your daughter and you're gonna be able to come back again. Yeah. So, anybody else have any thoughts on that about how sometimes you can doubt yourself and then how you find that? I mean, I have, but I applied for a position anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I wrote down here, nothing needs to tell you for the try. Like, either they're going to call me or they're not going to call me. So, right, I'm going to try it. Um, and I don't always have the qualifications, but if I feel like I can, I can learn whatever might be missing, then I'm going to apply for it. And that's just, I don't like the word no, so I'm going to do it anyway. Don't <laughs> know, I thought a problem, but. I'm going to need you to write that book down for me. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, Nobody said it all. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, of course we doubt ourselves. I think men and women doubt ourselves, but men have the guts to go ahead and apply. No offense, I know the men that are here. <laughs> but again, we females, we tend to be more, I guess, traditional kind of, you know, oh, you know, can I do it? We second guess ourselves. I don't either. I'm like Trina. I'm going to go for it because I went for it. Even not having a, a bachelor's degree, I went for it and I got it. It's also how you sell yourself, how you present yourself. And it's all in the delivery of what you're presenting, how you present yourself about the skills that you have. You know, I will tell you a lot of the in, in HR, a lot of the stuff, I know that the, the getting your degree is important, but a lot of the skills that you're also taught are at home, are the skills that you learn at your home. And being able to effectively communicate to people, being able to deliver your message, um, you know, accurately and all that. It's stuff that you do at home now. Listen, my kids, which are grown men now, they used to tell me, mom, stop with the HR stuff, right? <laughs> because it worked at home too, by the way. The HR stuff does work at home, people. But, you know, we tend to, as a female, we tend to, to second guess ourselves. And believe it or not, we're like superwoman because not only do we get the job, we run our family, we feed our families, we take our kids to the sporting events, whatever, and we juggle that, put everybody to bed, open the laptop, finish what you got to finish, and then do it the next day again. So it's not that we are now second guessing ourselves. I think the woman today, um, the mature and and actually, that when I'm near that age of retirement myself, okay. um, we we are better than what we were 20 years ago. I think the pandemic brought a lot of you know about um, my career. And when I went for my master's degree was in 2019, I finished. Um, not here, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but um, I had a plan. I left Jefferson. Um, hospital and said, I can't be running three hospitals at the same time. This is too much. I need I need something else. I'm going to do something else. So I had a plan. My plan crumbled because the pandemic hit, right? So you're like, oh, well, okay. But I didn't stop. I took my chances and I took my risk, started co making connections with everybody through LinkedIn, through um, social media, um, all the CCI, all those consulting groups. And I landed a job, believe it or not, with a cannabis company. Um, and I said, Which, what's the worst they can do? Let me apply for it. And it was a very interesting job. And for the record, I never took their products. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I learned something there, too, that you can take what you, your past experiences, what you have done in the past, and you just focus and you shift it to the other one. I think Jacqueline said it real good, how she shifted from different places that she loved what she was doing. Because everything you learn from one place, you do carry over, you carry over, you carry over to a point that now when I retire, my plan is to consult because I can now, because I've done it all. And Jacqueline is probably on the same. Well, not that we're going to say our, well, how old we are today. Absolutely but, not. <laughs> but those are all risks, you know, and we do. And I think that now that statistic is probably going to change in a year from now, because now you've got Gen Z and and all those uh, generations are coming up to pikes that are learning from us. So, but, uh, I'd like to add to that a little bit. Um, so uh, something that Vicki was talking about, like with her ch children and how her actions resonate with her uh, children. Um, my 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 daughter um, is very very important to me, and I like her to have no fear about anything that she wants to pursue. So um, understanding how to articulate what your wants are, where you want to go, right, is really, really important. And I think that that's my job to help her with that, not only by advising her, but by example as well. Um, and that's what I do. Um, and I'm very, very, very proud of her. I think this generation, the strength that they have to voice their opinions, whether it's pro-Palestine or pro-Israel or whatever it is they're doing, you know, being very much involved with the political scene, um, the way that they're able to uh, articulate what they're feeling and, you know, the wrongs that are happening um, is very, very impressive. And I just want to make sure that I'm there not to paralyze that, but to push that. That's a really good point. Um, and it's also... 
you know, it's yeah. I'm growing a little girl right now. So this is like very oh, much yeah. in my mind. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about how, how I can translate all of this uh, knowledge that's coming out into into what she's gonna be in. Yeah, Gen Z, those kids are all right. And yeah. I think, you know, they're they're doing good stuff. Um you'd also so. be surprised that some of the things I think you do are intentional that you're they're trying to teach your kids, but some is just this sort of they just absorb things from you that you don't know. My daughter is a senior in college, and she is a master networker. And oh yeah, she but she she grew up watching me go to networking events and talk to people on the phone and talk to clients. And she is completely comfortable picking up the phone and calling and reaching out and using her network to you know get get internships or get interviews for college for grad schools or whatever. And and some of her friends who are a little bit more reserved or like, Ava, can you help me find a job? They're like, no, you should call my mom. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they pick up stuff that you don't even know. I just thought that was really interesting this year. That's the first time she shared that with me. <laughs> That's, I mean, so we're talking a lot about our, our kids now, right? So, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the work-life balance situation, right? Which is, you touched on it a lot. All the things we're balancing right now. But what does work-life balance mean to you? You know, it means something to different to everybody. Different to everybody. Is it integration? Is it one or the other? Uh, you know, what what are your thoughts on that? Does anybody have want to chime in first? Well, I I don't like the term work um, life integration because that sounds intrusive, right? Um, I I still like the the phrase balance, right? Um, whether it's one is more than the other or and then it eventually evens itself out um at this time of my life i think it's very important that um i am uh connected with my family um there were things when uh in the beginning of my career i was extremely busy and we weren't able to you know travel as much or you know do things together um, it's a priority for me uh now um no ifs ands or buts about it um we like to travel. Um, my, my daughter and I, we travel all the time. Uh, this was something I wasn't able to do. I love her as an adult. Um, so that that's really important to me. And I think making the decision to work 100% remote also helps. Yeah. Um, early in my career, I don't, I don't even remember uh, that as an opportunity, uh, an option, you know. Um, I, after this uh, position, I said, I will never, you know, enter a brick and mortar <laughs> um, facility again. It is purely remote. And uh, the company I work for, Alta, uh, they encourage that. Um, and they are highly supportive of that. Uh, they were doing it actually before the pandemic, you know, so they had it, you know, uh, down packed already. Uh, I was very, very excited to join them and to be able to work on that work-life balance. Yeah, I, I think we talked a little bit earlier about how our lives changed post-pandemic. Some of us had the you know, hospital life, but some of us, some of us have, you know, continued to do the remote thing and it, it has changed everything. I mean, like, Absolutely, yeah. I would say that under the work-life balance, like I have to go in every day. I work in the hospital and visibility is very important. Right, because if you're dealing with uh, 1,200 employees that need HR, whatever, even though we have the services and the programs and stuff, you know, employee engagement, employee relations is very important. This is how you keep people employed, especially because at the end of the day, it's that child that we're taking care of. Um, but and there's a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, I report to someone that's very um, compassionate about how we feel, and we need a a day to, to work from home just to, you know, de-stress, um, that's no problem, but the visibility is important. But I will tell you, our day, my day is very, very busy as soon as I walk in to the time I leave. And sometimes I'm eating lunch, and sometimes I'm answering my husband's call in the restroom, which is not a good thing. <laughs> but, uh -huh. but with that being said, there, I've learned something with so many years working hard because we do work hard, right? We work hard for what we earn. And um, I've learned that as soon as I get in my car, I flip, I flip myself. 
right? I'm like no longer the VP of HR. I am now back to Wanda Merrill, the mother of two, grandmother of three, right? And I put my radio on because I love music. So I start to sing whatever's on there. I don't know all the words, but I do. <laughs> and that helps me. So by the time that 40 minute drive to get back home, I'm now back to myself because whatever happened that day in my job, I'm not taking it home. And that is something that I always express to everyone and advise people to find a way to not talk about your place of employment when you get home. You should be talking about more about how was your day, babe? Oh, it was good, you know, a little busy, whatever. But how did the kids do in school or do something different? Watch your favorite, watch Jeopardy or watch the, the next uh, season of Netflix, whatever the case may be. Do something like that because I can guarantee you that the next day when you wake up to go to work, your your mind is fresh. Your brain is more relaxed. And you get up in the morning, that uh, buzzer is ringing because I still have my old clock. <laughs> you know, I can't use my phone because I dropped my phone a couple times and it's not good. But um, that helps me start my new day. And it's like, you know, is it Groundhog Day? I don't know if you guys remember that in the Bill Murray movie that you start to do the same thing over and every day. But that 5.30 or whatever time I'm leaving to go home, that's what I do. I get in my car, the radio comes on. I'm now changing. I'm flipping my switch. I'm no longer the VP of HR. I'm me. And that's my advice. That's how I work my balance in my life. So. I would add to that. I think that that phrase is, you have to figure out what works for your life and what works for you and your personality and how you work too. Mm -hmm. You know, I know people who say you should go on vacation and shut your laptop and not turn it, not look at your email, like put it all away. And that works great for some people. For me, that stresses me out more. <laughs> um, so I need to check my email every morning. Like I might be at the beach. I'll, I'll check my email in the morning before I go to the beach at the end of the day. And I come back, I'll check it again to make sure I didn't miss anything. Because to me, to come back to a thousand emails mm -hmm. is just, my brain would explode. Um, and also just, I run a company, so if something major comes up, I need to be accessible and available. So I think there's that. But I also, you know, we made a pretty um, purposeful, the way we run our company is pretty purposeful in that we, we made a decision that we were going to treat everybody like adults, get your job done. And that means, you know, that Maybe you work better in the morning. Maybe you work better in the evening. But if you need to leave at three o'clock to go to your kid's soccer game, I'm going to do that. So why wouldn't I let my employees or do that as well? So I think there's a lot of trust there. Um, I want to be able to do those things. So I will get up and check my email at five in the morning and do those things so that I have the flexibility to be able to go do things with my family at three o'clock if I want to as well. So I just think I can't... I, there's not just a perfect solution. Right. I just think everybody has to figure out what works for their life. And and that changes over time. I mean, my life is very different now with two kids in college than it was when my kids were in elementary school. It's completely different. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Vicki, you said something so key, which is we're all adults. And so however you get the work done is how you get the work done. So I want to touch on that. Um, so my team, you know, we were either in the office, out the office, wherever I was explaining that earlier, um, but I also want them to know that if you have something going on personally, you can work from home. Take care of what you need to take care of because at the end of the day, the work is still going to be there. Um, and so I've established it such that they know that if they have to take care of something personal, go ahead and do it. I'm not going to hound them about it um, because I want them to be able to have that work-life balance as well. Um, I mean, even for me recently, I haven't been in the office probably all month long because... I'm not put this out there, honey. My husband um, had surgery. So I've had to work from home to be able to, you know, care for him. And so one thing that one of my team members said to me, and he put his put my words back on me was, you take care of what you need to take care of because that's what you tell us. Um, and so part of my work-life balance too is that I put my phone on do not disturb in the morning. So nothing before nine o'clock comes to me. Uh, because what I found was in the beginning of me being in this position, I was always accessible. As soon as I opened my eyes, text message, phone call, I was answering. And I said, I can't. I need my time in the morning to be able to deal with me to, you know, kind of get myself ready for the day. And so I put it on do not disturb until nine o'clock. So nobody can catch me before nine o'clock. <laughs> 
Um, I don't schedule meetings after four, so my assistant knows no meetings after four, and I shut it down at five. And then maybe for an hour or so, I'm vegging out on the couch or in my chair or my office because I just need a minute. And then I, you know, do my personal stuff for, you know, the evening. But um, that's, you know, my work-life balance. And I'm in school, so I have to really be able to balance as well. So, Chad, I'm jealous. <laughs> you jealous? Yeah. <laughs> that school component adds, like, that, I mean, oh, yeah. for all materials, right? That, yeah. that adds a huge complexity to it. Mm -hmm. And you have to, that extra thing you have to start thinking. Right. Um, I want to check in on time. Are yeah, we, I think we're uh, ready for some questions, questions and answers. And answers. Yeah. Right. Not all at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, go first. Sure. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's quite a question or whatever. Um, so I'm in. A, my name is Wandy, by the way, and um, and I'm looking to do a career change. I'm just I'm ready to to make the change. I am an alum. I have my bachelor's degree. Working on my master's, we'll talk about it then. <laughs> um, but you know, um, I feel like at this point in my life, I'm ready to pivot and change. I, I feel like I have a lot of um, transferable skills. However, you know, applying online and even with networking or whatever, you know, you have a lot of organizations that will say you want experience. You know, someone with experience is kind of like, well, um, a little bit with you know, Vicky was saying like, you know, I have a lot of transferable skills and it may not be exactly what it is that, you know, again, I'm learning, I cut it here, just apply anyway. Men do it all the time. So I'm like, I'm applying what they were asking for is such and such. Just apply for it anyway. But um, I think I'm in a position where, um, I'm, again, I'm looking for career change, um, but they're looking for experience. Like, how how could I get over that? Or, you know, what techniques or what, what ways that I can show or at least get in front of someone to speak to them about you know my transferable skills and you know to my degree level. If anybody has any advice for that, have you thought about taking a temporary job? No, because I got a living. <laughs> 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 I guess I guess my my point is a lot of times if it's if it's a, a contract position, sometimes they'll they'll take a chance on someone, um, and then it can end up being something full time down the road but okay. a lot of times it's not people are a little bit more open-minded um when we're looking at somebody for a temporary job we'll transfer the skills and uh, another thing that that uh, i would probably do whatever that skill is that you you like or need do your homework learn more about it read something about it so when let's say they do call you and say you know and you say well i've never done it but i know X, Y, and Z about it, and the, and I know the functionalities. And you start to use those keywords. People will say to you, you know what? Come on in, and then that's the opportunity for you once you got your foot in the door to sell your the rest of your skills. So I always said that if you lack something, and you know that they put because your resume should always be tweaked for the position that you apply for, right? Yeah. So if you you know that something that they're looking for that you might not feel comfortable about it, do your homework, read about it, Google it, YouTube it. There's plenty of information out there. Or ask your professor that you're, you know, that you're in school, how can you acquire that? And learn about it because if you can talk about it, you know about it, right? I think AI is taking over with those keywords, but I, I said to the knowledge is powerful. So um, knowing a little bit about that topic will help you open that door. Another approach, and also if if you're if you have a little bit more time at your current organization. Um, if there are projects or uh, any type of uh, um, something that's happening that's related to that, you know, um, if you can insert yourself in, in those teams uh, to gain experience, uh, that that might be helpful uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. My name is Tony, also here's a lot. I um I, I work in human resources and um when I started my career at in human resources I started at Tasty and I worked there for a few years and um, when I got promoted I feel like every promotion I have a sense of like imposter syndrome like what am I doing here I, I get it still sometimes now like I'm a director of human resources where I currently work and how do you how do you overcome that yeah it never ends. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but do you want to elaborate on that? 
I mean, I, 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 I Juno Capital is a, is a great example. So we, when we started that company, that organization where we were doing investment, I'm like, I don't have an investment background. And so I sit in rooms sometimes with David Edelman. He's like, I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's like a big investor in Philly. And I'm like, what am I doing sitting in a room? <laughs> like, I just, you just feel like, why am I here? But you do deserve to be there. You do bring something to the table. Maybe I don't have $20 million to invest, but, um, you know, I still feel like, we're still trying to get to the same thing, maybe just at different levels. You still deserve to be there. You're bringing, yeah. You wouldn't be in the room if you didn't have something to, to bring to the table. Remember what I said earlier? You have every right to be there, and that's your seat ticket. Yeah. But kind of like the proverbial tap on the shoulder, like, you know, and you're looking, uh, looking back. But, yeah, you deserve to be there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and just as a comment, I like to say work life harmony just because it's like not always life. balanced. Sometimes mm -hmm. something else wins, but if it works for you, make it harmonize that experience. I like that. We any other questions? Anything online? Much. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> As such inspiring leaders that you all are, what were some of the formative experiences or challenges that you've had to overcome during your leadership journey that you feel really shaped you into the leader that you became and that you are today. This is kind of like one of the questions. Yeah, I like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Watching leaders that weren't so great. It, or, I actually have learned more from people who were good leaders than I have from good leaders. I've learned what not to do many times. Yeah. Yeah, and great. also that's just key. Yeah, yeah, many times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I worked for a company at one point who I felt, I just remember thinking I would never treat my employees that way. And I never will ever. There were just some things that happened and, and that actually stayed with me the most. There's a, there's a, uh, maybe a YouTube or Google or whatever that has the, what it does it mean to be a leader and what does it mean to be a boss? Mm -hmm. There's like a picture in the middle mm -hmm. and you always want to focus on the leader side. And you're right. You come across people that you say, you know what? I will never be like this person mm -hmm. because one of the things that you get to, <clears throat> that it's very important with, with being a leader is you have to listen, right? You have to listen to your, your employees and you need to, you're going to, if you have 27 people, you're going to have 27 different behaviors. And how do you, how do you cope with that? Um, and then doing the challenge of people that leaders, you know, when I was at a lower position, it was hard because I couldn't say anything. But now that I'm in a higher position, I stop them on their tracks, but it's a way how you do it. So you perfect the way you communicate and say, you know, I see what you want to do. I know what you want to accomplish it. Let me teach you and coach you and mentor you on how to do it better. Um, and that's where my experiences of dealing with these people that were very challenging in my career that I know, you know what, I can use this as an example because this is not what I want to be. So I think that um, for me, communicating is good too. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also add to that relationship, like building a relationship with the people that you that you meet. Um, I'm very intentional when I when I talk about my team. I don't say that I manage them. I lead them. Um, and I take that very seriously because they're in my care um, in terms of their their career, but also personal. Um, because there are things that as a leader and you form that relationship, they're going to tell you things that they may not necessarily tell someone else who they've reported. So I think relationship added with that communication is good. I think the word you used was approachable. Right, being approachable. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I do want to uh, state that has been very important to me is that um, don't let anyone else control the direction you want to go. You pay your way, right? You meet with whomever you need to in order to continue that journey of wherever it is you want to go. You know, even if you're not certain of the direction you want to go, 
have people around you, you know, that can help with that, that can coach you. You know, that's that's really important because a lot of times we leave our uh, careers or the direction, the trajectory of our careers in the hands of other people. Don't no. do that. You take ownership of that and you make it happen. Any other questions? Before you, before you reach the leadership roles you're in now, and you've had that confidence to go after what you wanted, is there anything that you look back and maybe regretted not making the choice then? Like an opportunity you gave up, or someone encouraging you something and you thought, no, I can't do that, or any, anything that you were that you reflect on? I think for me, um, it, it's all lessons learned, right? I don't like to say I regret it, but um, there were certain loyalties I I thought what were loyalties, they really weren't, right? Um, and I'll leave it at that. You should be loyal to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> really. I probably stayed in one job too long just because it was comfortable. Um, and it worked for my life at the time, but I stayed way too long. If I'm being honest, I wasn't trying to be in leadership. I really, I'm a background person. Like I introverted, I would rather give me administrative tasks to do and I'll be behind the scenes and you know, you can shine and do, I didn't want to be in this position, but you know, someone saw something in me that I wasn't necessarily Trying to, but here I am. So I got moved. <laughs> it's good when you have a. Uh, also, it's also good when you have a uh, a strong, um, a, a a strong foundation. You know, um, there are those colleagues that'll stand by you and support you, um, whether you're at that company or not at another company. Um, and I found that to be true as well. Don't let anyone tell you what you, what your word is. You should know that. Sorry. Um, I'll stand. Um, thank you all for your time, especially since given when you normally end your day, it's late for all you. Um, I'm Linda Hollis, and I have to be an attorney, so I fail the work-life balance thing. Um, but I'm curious, in our law firm, we talk a lot about our responsibility to be a mentor, to be an ally. Lots of literature out there about what the difference of those two things are. But I'm curious about how you see your role evolve in that, that particular capacity with folks. And I know sometimes I say to the junior people um, who talk about their nervousness, about how taking on that new task, I say, you know, every problem that you solve is an opportunity for you. You are a problem solver for somebody who didn't know how to solve the problem for themselves. And I think that translates beyond, you know, my particular industry to a lot of others. But I'm curious, you know, sometimes they look at me and they say, I don't know, but <laughs> I'm curious, you know, what kinds of things you might uh, suggest or think about from, the, from your responsibility to be a mentor and to, you know, pass that along to some extent. I think for me in the healthcare environment, um, because we, uh, in HR, you, you have to help the managers lead, right? And some of the managers, like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in examples of physician, right? A physician goes to school to be a doctor, but they don't learn really how to engage with their staff, right? Mm -hmm. So they have these issues and whatever have you. And, you, you you have conversations, but before you start to say the negative, because real quick, every every employer, you always say the negative first without saying the positive, right? I've learned that saying the positive is great, and then you discuss what the issues are, but you also have to have a solution as to what should I do to help you be better at your role? How can I support you? Whether it's training, whether it's um, you know, employee relations, building relationships, like Sarah said, with your your the, the colleagues or your coworkers. 
Um, we have a responsibility as leaders to say, I see where you lack. I know what you need. Let me help you get there. And that has helped me a lot thinking. And one of the things that I do a lot too, which is kind of crazy, I don't know how I do it, is that when a situation comes to me, I put the pros and cons, it just kind of like pops in my head, like like popcorn, and it gives, just gives me a list of what I see that, what is the problem, but where's the opportunity, and how can I make this person better? Um, and in HR, you have to think like that all the time. And I think that has helped me become a better leader, and that's why I use the word approachable, because then they come back for more mentoring and coaching of how to handle different situations. And before you know it, they're handling their own stuff. And I don't know if that helps with your question, but um, I think that sometimes we, we assume that what we're communicating is they understand. And another thing that I do a lot is I always check for understanding. Because on a Monday morning, I do speak Spanish at home. So my English is not the greatest on a Monday morning. But, but I always check for understanding because I want to make sure that what I'm communicating to that leader, other leader or the employee, that they understand what I'm saying, what are their resources, and how can I help you get there? So yeah. I'd like to add a little to that um, as well. So nervousness and uh, uncertainty, that's a part of my DNA, right? With almost anything I do. Um, what I try to uh, let the people um, I'm responsible for know is that you can turn that into, or at least you should turn that into energy, right? If you're not nervous, if you're, if you're not uncertain, right? Uh, that means you, you're comfortable, right? By experiencing this, this is kind of like you being outside of the box a little bit and turn that into energy. That should be a catalyst for you to do whatever it is you want to do. Don't let it hold you back, you know, just because you're nervous, you know, um, and just be able to talk your staff through that. Um, I have one um, team member who's new to her role and she thinks that everybody else is doing it really quickly and, you know, um, but the reason why we hired you for that role is because we see the potential. We know that there's a learning curve and we're okay with that. You need to be okay with that. That's how I would approach it. I also um, would add, I, I often give my team um, responsibility or I'll, I'll give them a client before I think they're, or they think, or even I think they might be ready to manage it because if they make a little bit of a mistake, that is not the end of the world to me because I think that it gives them a little bit of confidence that I trust that they at least have, they at least have the potential to be able to do this. And I think if they get, if you give them a little bit of a boost and that confidence, they'll step up. And if they mess something up, we can fix it. Sure. We're not hard surgeons. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, know, you know, it's okay. We'll, we'll go back and fix it. But I think that that helps people grow. Um, with that. One of my favorite things to say to my team is usually, we don't work in a hospital, nobody's dying. Yeah, it's fine. No, that's probably going to work for you. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, you know, yeah, here, we can, we can totally <laughs> figure it out. So. <laughs> I think we're going to go to a question from our virtual audience. Susan, go ahead. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want, I don't have any questions, but I just want to add that I've been working for almost 10 years. I've been an IT analyst, first in troubleshooting, but I currently serve in quality insurance. I do surveys. And also, I have my share of dealing with some experiences that some folks may think that my voice is, is too automated and more sound like um, artificial intelligence. But my parents always tell me, take it off and just let it go. And my boss will tell me, move on. Don't let it get the best of you. And that's like, I want to share that to encourage the other sisters also in the room or online as well, that no matter what, what no matter what anyone says, they don't they don't know you because you're just talking to them on the phones. I work in a call center. But um there were times I had my good days, I had my bad days. I always remember to never lose faith. I'll get through the day just like I did today. I love that. Never lose faith. That's true. 
Um, going to a question that's been typed in the chat. So I'm going to read it out and I'll stand up here. Uh, so have you experienced having to return to the workforce after becoming an entrepreneur? If so, how was the transition to return to work? This is from Rachel. She said, do you have any tips when interviewing and finding that employers aren't interested in me because I have a business? Sheena is here. It was a little difficult and it was only difficult because of what I, my salary expectations. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to make us below a certain number. So that was the most difficult. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of being an entrepreneur and then coming and then going back into the workforce, there's a way to explain why you're ready to do that now. Uh, and I mean, it, it happened because I was able to go back into the workforce after um, being out for two years and running my own business. So it's it's possible. You just have to be be creative and be strategic in how you do it. Hey, back. I haven't gone. I haven't <laughs> had to go back. I mean, maybe who knows? Fast forward ten years, <laughs> maybe I'll go do something else. But I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we did have a question in the back. Hi, uh, thank you. What advice do you have um, when you're you're still at the point of working to the level of leadership that you you, know, you, you want to get to, but in your current role, you know, you've become that problem solver, you become that person that colleagues see you as a leader, and they come to you and often often ask for your help, but you also don't want to be taken advantage of in terms of not being offered something more to be a different, you know, be a leader, but yet, you know, your willingness to help others and to learn new things and problem solve and make you that person and you're stuck kind of in the process of trying to be that team player, but not also getting to the level where you think you should be based on what you bring to the table. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those opportunities, unfortunately, are not there in that organization. You know, so you need to pave your way. Um, if it's not there, if there are no job opportunities there or not enough recognition there, maybe time to move on. I agree with that. I think that sometimes you get you get pigeonholed into a role yeah. within your organization and you're viewed a certain way, and it isn't until you break out and they go somewhere yeah. else that they look at you differently. You relax. And you take those transferable skills, right? right. And you, yeah. Not that. Oh, yes. Time for one more. Sorry. Time for one more. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I know that uh, Trina mentioned um, she didn't want to go back into the workplace. Um, she wanted a specific salary. So can any one of you explain the time that you actually had to advocate for, a, uh, you know, a higher salary or a better salary within the workplace? Oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, like you're right, I think you said the other day, uh, just now too, that we become valuable to an organization when we build those skills and people start to come to us instead of the director, right? And you start to develop and start to know what is your worth, right? And um, a couple of times when I apply for positions, because if there's no growth, I will correct in your current employer, you want to look for that growth because that's what you want to how you build your career. Um, you have to understand what is your worth. So, you know, right now you can Google and go to uh, all the websites to see approximately what kind of salary range for these positions that you're applying for. So you've got to understand what you're looking for. You don't want to go and say, I want to make, a, you know, six figures off the stuff if you're applying for a clerk job, right? It doesn't work that way. Okay. But you got to understand what is it that you want to reach for. And you can negotiate a salary when you're being offered a position. Because there is wiggle room out there. You just got to know how to learn how to negotiate of what you're looking for. You know, so, um, and, you know, to your question. So, yes, I had to negotiate because I know I started to understand what I was worth and what can I bring to the table. And lo and behold, I was able to negotiate what I wanted. 
It took a while, but it, I did it. And also know um, what your responsibilities were when you initially come into the position and then um, how you've grown, the additional responsibilities that you have. And you take that to the table and you, you know, um, you say that this is the difference. How will you compensate me for this growth? Sometimes it works. Sometimes they think on a pandemic. You have no fun. I'm not sure who asked that question, but I've been in that situation. And Miss Marcy, I don't know if you remember me. I'm not yeah. here. I, I sure enough called Miss Marcy and she coached me through it. And I got the salary that we negotiated. <laughs> and I called her back. I said, I, I got it. She's like, I, I told you you did. I did. <laughs> um, so if, if, if there's any advice that I could provide, Miss Marcy is a very, very, very good, but a very good resource for that. And then she's helped me. So I thank you for that. We're over here tearing up. <laughs> wow. And don't forget, as alums, you have lifelong access to the yeah. center. Yeah. So they're always there for you. All right, Francis. I see. It's I see. Short. I see. I I promise. Promise. I promise. And it's actually to add to what she was just asking, but this is specific to Vicky. You early on mentioned, con I think it was for D, that you offered, um, you asked, have you considered contracts for you know temporary positions? And I do a lot of that. So my specific question around that is, is there as much wiggle room for a contract or a temporary position similar to a you mean in, as far as your your app, like your rate, your comp? It de it depends on the type of role. I mean, as an agency, when people come to us, they give us a budget. We have some wiggle room on what we can pay people. The thing that so the thing you don't want to get into is if you take a contract role and you have this inflated comp. And I've done and I've done a lot of it. And that happens, yeah. And then yeah. sometimes though, then if they decide to offer you a permanent role, but then the permanent role pays significantly less, right? Then you, so there's a, there's a little bit of a balance. It depending on what kind of work it is, you know, you know, um higher level HR contract roles can be extremely lucrative for that's a, Good idea to go into consulting. <laughs> it is very lucrative, but you know, if it, but it's for a short period of time. So it's, I think it depends on what kind of role it is. If it's literally to come in and cover someone's maternity leave, not so much. But if it's for a project, there's there's a lot. And that's more. what I'm asking. Yeah, I'm not asking. Then there is for that. that. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that I don't know about you guys. I'm feeling emboldened. I'm feeling excited to take on the risks and challenges coming forth. Uh, and I just am so grateful to our wonderful panel, our moderator. Can we have a round of applause? And thank you so, so very much. Did I make that too bad? Um, and also, thank you so much to our panelists. We have a little token of our appreciation. Oh, well, besides the bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a few thank yous. Uh, additionally, thank you to everybody who came out today. Thank you to everybody who came virtually. Um, major props to the whole team at Pierce for getting this event off the ground. Um, Dr. Rita Tal Roberts, Brad Hodge, Elizabeth Kraft, Joe Gazzardo, you guys always got my back um, for throwing these events and uh, and taking us to, uh, Dr. Caro, for taking us to the next level as a college. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, and we are just so excited to, to take all these learned lessons to the next the next step. Uh, major props to Adriana Owens for taking my crazy phone calls and chats every time I'm, I'm, I have a new idea of how to promote or what else I want. She's rolling with the punches. Huge props to my team, Andrew Zidel, for getting this great panel. Um, 
Um, these are wonderful career development counselors. So if you are a student or an alum of Pierce College, definitely thank you, Nefetira, for making that shout out. That is exactly what we love to hear. And that's exactly what we're here for. You have a lifetime membership to the Center for Career and Professional Development. Um, okay, so on the back of your papers, we've got a QR code. Please let us know how we did tonight. Um, a couple of and I think I put it in the chat for those of you who are joining us online. A um, couple of upcoming events. We've got our Pierce Sherm HR panel coming up on April 2nd. Level Up Forever Employable on the April 18th. The Career and Networking Fair right here in this very spot on May 1st. And our Cybercrime, Cybersecurity, and FinTech panel happening on May 22nd. Thank you again so much. I appreciate all of your time, all of your excellent energy, and I'm riding this one all the way home tonight. Thank you so much.